Now we're going to start Unit 3. Uh, unit 3 is focused on forces, and uh, Chapter 4, the initial part of Unit 3, is specifically going to focus on uh, Newton's laws and then definitions of forces, types of forces, and kind of a setup for problem solving, which will be more in Chapter 5. First of all, we have to um, delineate between uh, kinematics and uh, dynamics. Kinematics is what we've been studying previously. Uh, it's a description of motion, right? Uh, it does not address why. We just had to assume that things were going the way they were for a certain reason. So, for example, in this um, picture here, you know, it would just say that this bobsled or some other object, you know, accelerates in this direction. Uh, what we're going to do now is talk about the change of motion as a result of forces. Basically, why does it accelerate in that direction? Because a force is applied or an unbalanced force is applied. This is called, the study of forces is specifically called dynamics. So dynamics is the change of motion as a result of forces. So kinematics is what we've been doing. Now we're going to get into the forces part, which is dynamics. Now, Newton's big idea that he had to uh, tackle and solve was, do you need to keep pushing on a, something to keep it going? Now, conventional wisdom before that was, yes, if I push on anything, I can get it moving, but then I have to keep pushing on it in order for it to keep moving, because it just comes to a stop. So they thought the natural order of things were to be at rest. Everything wanted to be at rest. Newton came along and said, well, let me think about this a little bit deeper, and he said, no, no, things do not want to be at rest, things want to keep their same motion, okay? Uh, in reality, it depends, right, because in a more complex thing, you have things like friction, and you have to overcome friction, or keep up with friction, or meet friction, or whatever you want to do, and um, so really, it depends, but in fundamental, fundamentally, you know, as a law, you do not need to keep pushing on something to keep it going in space or without friction or without something else like that. Okay, and this leads to Newton's first law. An object at rest will remain at rest. An object in motion will remain in the same motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Now, this is Newton's first law. According to middle school, right? Middle school, that's this is good enough, right? But if I put a book on the table, if I put a ball on the table, if I just look at anything in the world um, that has mass, you know, uh, and I look at it and says, and I say to myself, what forces are acting on it? Well, all of the, all of these objects have uh, the force of gravity acting on them. So here's a table, right? And if I have a book here, or some kind of object, if this has some kind of mass, then gravity wants to pull it down, right? And really what happens is the reason it doesn't move is because the table pushes it up at the same time, all right? And there's some kind of balance going on here. So really the more appropriate sentence to use is that um, everything's the same, so remain in the same motion unless acted upon by an outside, uh, not an outside force, right, but an unbalanced force, right, so specifically unbalanced. The idea that if, you know, if I draw my table again, and I have my book, right, you know, I have this going down, a balance that's going up, I have to apply some kind of make something unbalanced in order for this thing to change its motion. If it's at rest, then it will, you know, accelerate or move. Uh, if it's, you know, already moving, then it will accelerate, so on, so on. All right, but the key thing for us is unbalanced. And this will be, you know, we'll talk about this as some kind of, you know, some kind of net force that remains. Okay, net force, one of our key things that we're going to be talking about in this section. If we look at objects and we look at things um, from a perspective of force and how they move, 
you'll notice that some things when apply when you apply a force move differently than others. A bowling ball will move differently from a ping pong ball or um, some other kind of object like that. No idea is that there's something called inertia. All right, inertia is an object's desire or want to maintain their motion as it is, even if that motion is no motion. All right. So uh, inertia is a property of matter and a property of an object. Inertia is best, right, uh, summed up by mass. Mass is really a measurement of inertia. So when you think of inertia, you think of you should be thinking about mass. And I specifically want to say mass and not bigness or size or anything else like that, all right? Inertia is about how much mass something has, how many atoms are inside of that, all right? All that's, that's inside, all that's wrapped up in the idea of mass and inertia, okay? Um, objects want to maintain their complete motion. Complete motion is both speed and direction, so if something is moving in some kind of at some speed, ten meters per second to the east, it wants to stay at ten meters per second to the east. It requires an unbalanced force to change either that speed or that direction. Um, a sim very simplified version of a f definition of a force is a interaction between two objects, right? Um, in a form of a push or a pull, and we'll talk about different forces in this chapter, and you'll see exactly what I mean by a push or a pull. Some things are only capable of one or the other. So these are rules for forces, right? First of all, right, forces must act on objects, right? So if I look over here to the left, I have an object right here, right? This is being acted upon or on. It requires an agent, right? An agent is something that is going to create the force, right? So in this case, it is the, the glove or the arm or the, or the man or whatever it is. It is the agent of the force. Something acts on another object. This object right here, the person acts on another object. Force is a vector, right, which has a magnitude and direction, which makes it important that both of these values are represented. And specifically, all forces will break down into um, two categories, either contact forces or long range. I'll tell you that 90% of what we'll deal with in this class is going to be contact forces, which leaves only about 10%. Here. There's only really one long-range force that we'll talk about, and that is either what you want to call weight or, you know, gravity, All right? There's other ones, you know, magnetism, um, let's see, electric force, which we'll talk about at the end of the semester, and... Um, even some, some weird ones like strong nuclear force and weak nuclear force, all that kind of stuff like that. These are our long range, also called uh, field forces. And um, but again, we'll we'll deal with those much later on, um, either next in physics two, or in the idea of um, uh, electric force, which we'll deal with. But for now, we're just going to look at weight. Will be our only long range force. Okay, as we said, forces are vectors, right? Vectors have magnitudes and directions. Uh, the same way as we've done it before, length is the magnitude of the force, while uh, direction is the direction in which the force acts, right? I have to have both. I can't just say, push on that box at, you know, 10 newtons of force. You, I have to tell you 10 newtons of force in what direction, because it makes a difference. Do I want it to go left, right? Do I want to pull it up? Do I want to push it down? It, direction matters. Um, okay, when I draw a force vector, it's going to originate from the object that receives the force. So here's an example. 
I'll do a little bit of drawing off screen and I'll come back. Okay, in this situation that you see below, I have a person exerting a force on an object. He's pushing on this crate, this box, this whatever you want to call it. And so uh, when I do a force vector, I'm drawn so they originate from the object that receives the force. So in reality, right, um, this is what's happening. There's a force that's being applied like this. It has a magnitude and a direction. But whenever we draw this vector, we actually draw it not necessarily from where it, um, from where it uh, is, but where uh, drawn so it originates from the object that receives it. So uh, let me let me erase that and draw it here. All right, it's the same thing. All right, it really came from the person pushing, but I draw it from the center of the object, you know, or something else like that. All right, uh, another example here, if I have a uh, soccer ball is kicked to the southeast. All right, so that means that some kind of foot, that's a really bad foot. That's even worse than I thought. All right, so let me try that again. Oh, that's, okay, that's bad. Anyway, it's cooked, kicked to the southeast, which means there's some kind of motion, you know, from this foot. This is a foot, by the way. Um... So, some kind of motion here that kicks this soccer ball here to the southeast. When I draw a force vector, I say it starts from, do that again, uh, from the object and gets kicked to the southeast. And the idea is that, you know, the length of this, the length of this vector um, right here is the magnitude. And this is the direction, the idea, to the southeast. If it's a greater force, then I make it longer. If it's a weaker force, I make it uh, less. All right, I can just as well have multiple forces acting on an object uh, simultaneously. Um, and what I would do to find the overall force, and this is a key vocab term that we'll use a lot, the net force. To find the net force, we will uh, add up uh, all the force vectors acting uh, on the object. Okay, this is the net force. So let's say I have this is a bird eye, bird's eye view of a crate. So this is really a some kind of crate or something like that. But we'll just represent it as a dot there. Um, and it's being pulled to the east um, with a certain amount of force. I'm called F1, and it's also being pulled to the west with a certain amount of force, F2. All right? If these two forces were equal, were equal in magnitude, and the question was which direction does it end up going, um, you should get the idea that um, these two are going to cancel each other out. In reality, it's not going to go anywhere. It's kind of like a tug of war uh, that doesn't go anywhere, all right. But if I were to, and this is this also can be done with just vector addition. If, what's the net force between these two right here? Well, I just add my forces. This one's east. This one's west. When I add them, it's essentially the same as like a subtraction. In that case, and they cancel each other out. Um, but if I play a little bit different game, and I say uh, that um, this force right here, let's get rid of this, I can't erase it, so I'll just get rid of it like that, is no longer being applied to the left, now it's being applied to the right. Okay. Now it says, what is the net force? The first case, when it was being applied to the left, right? I had zero net force because they canceled each other out. In this case, they're both going in the same direction, so my net force right, will actually be even farther. Right? It will be double, twice as much. So I can think of it as two ways. If I just add my individual forces, um, right, and that's what I'm doing as long as I keep track. The idea of these are vectors. And so you got the arrows here. These are vectors, so I will deal with that a little bit more later, uh, very similar to what we did last chapter. 
Um, or we can use this, you know, this is just a summation symbol, the sum of the forces, which is the same thing as saying the net force, same thing. Force 1 plus force 2 plus force whatever. Right? The sum of the forces is equal to the net force. Right? Whatever is left over is called the resultant, just as we had before, and that has a magnitude and direction. So we're going to have very similar steps that we did from vectors from the last chapter. Okay, in this next section, we'll be going through a list of forces, and what we call the names of forces, right? Now, keep in mind, these are all forces. These are all pushes and pulls. We just give them a category or a name so that when we talk about tension, or for example, we know what kind of force, where it kind of originates from, or normal force, or thrust, or something else like that. And so it's really just a formality, but... It helps us kind of identify things and do shortcuts for properties. All right. So the first one we'll talk about is weight. Weight is another word for the force due to gravity or gravitational force or something else like that. All right. So the idea is that force, uh, gravity pulls on objects. When we talked about projectile motion, we talked about how it pulls things down. Well, that is a force of gravity that is doing that. All right, it affects all objects. You're not able to hide from gravity. Right, some people think, okay, if I put something on top of a table like this, right, it's, you know, gravity's down here, gravity's affecting the table, but it's not affecting this. And that's, that's incorrect. This is, um, this is still experiencing gravity. Or, you know, if I go, you know, underwater, right, if I go underwater, then... We I can escape gravity, right? Because I just have water. I'm floating, right? But that's not true either. And the craziest thing is actually if you go to International Space Station, right? You still have not escaped gravity. Gravity's still there, um, but it's a special case in a way. Uh, and I'll go ahead and tell you because it has this horizontal motion. And this is what someone cancels it out, and we'll talk about that later, right? Uh, next chapter. So the key thing is that, you know, gravity acts on all objects as long as you're near some kind of gravitational source like a planet, a moon, um, you know, a sun, or something else like that, black hole, right? All this is force of gravity. Now, the key, key, key things to get in your head right now, is weight is different from the term mass, right? Weight is different from the term mass, okay? Weight, specifically, is the force due to gravity. I do F little g. Now I could use this symbol also, either one of those two. So this is the force due to gravity. Mass is a measurement of inertia. Mass is a measurement of inertia or stuff. S-T-U-F-F. -F. Stuff. Right? Uh, the amount of stuff something has inside of it. You know, protons, neutrons, electrons, quarks, gluons, whatever, all that kind of stuff like that, all right? That is inertia and mass. Weight, on the other hand, can change because it changes along with the force of gravity. If I go somewhere else that has a lesser gravitational force or grav lesser gravitational field, let's say like the moon, then I will actually have a different weight on the moon but I have the exact same amount of stuff that's inside my body. That stuff inside my body does not change, and so my mass does not change. My weight will decrease or increase or whatever, but my stuff or my mass stays the same, which is a property of inertia. Right? And so the idea is that weight, I know that we use these uh, synonymously in our language, but weight and mass are two different things. Mass specifically is about the stuff and inertia, and weight is the 
force or gravity that happens to be on you due to some other heavy object, like a planet or moon or, or sun or black hole. Uh, the other thing about uh, weight is it always points downwards, right? So no matter what, if I toss a ball straight up into the air like this, and it comes back down like that, right? One-dimensional kind of free-fall motion. Well, the entire time, there's a force of gravity going downwards. But if I also go something like this, and I toss a ball into the air on this path, well, guess what? Every instant along the way, my weight is always going downwards, right? Always down. No matter if it's up and down path or if it's a projectile motion type path like that, right? Weight is always going down. And what we do is we do a little arrow and then we do our little symbol that we have over here, okay? That's a lot of drawing. The next force we'll talk about is spring force, also sometimes called uh, elastic force. Elastic or spring forces come from things that are being uh, extended or compressed, things like springs. Right? It has some kind of natural length, and if I pull on it, right, then I stretch it out. If I push on it, then I can compress it. And as I do that, I feel the force of it wanting to go back to where it was, all right? So if I, you know, compress something like here, um, if I compress the spring this way, then this, this force of the spring is going to go to the right, right? It's pushing on this object, so I draw this force to the right. In this case, if I stretch the spring, I pull it back like this, the force of the spring wants to pull it back to where it was, all right? And that's what's represented here. We'll cover this in more detail in later chapters with um, Hooke's Law and a bunch of other things like that. But for now, just know that the spring force comes from springs being stretched or compressed. Right? And we say F of SP, SP for spring, or even sometimes F of E um, or EL or something like that for elastic. Right? E, like E-L or something like that, um, for elastic. Our next force is a common one. Uh, it's called tension. Tension specifically comes from uh, pushes or pulls that are transmitted through wire, rope, chain, whatever. For the most part, it's all pull. Um, there are some cases where pushes can be transmitted through an object. We still call it tension, but for the most part, we'll be pulling things like in this example. Uh, like rope exerts a tension, um, rope exerts a tension force on the sled. If I have my sled here and a rope, and I pull on it, basically my pull is on this end of the rope. The rope itself transmits, right? Transmits a force to here, and that force always acts in the direction of the rope, wire, string, thread, whatever. So if it's at this angle, then that's where the force acts. Now keep in mind, this sled right here may actually move right, horizontally, but the force that acts on it is this way. And we'll get into how that works um, much later on. Um, symbol is capital T for tension. But again, in multiple textbooks and multiple whatever, you'll see things like F and then T for t you know as something that's you know same as that. Okay, um, so there's multiple ways you can see that. But tension specifically comes from wires, ropes, chains in contact with something else and being pulled. Next, we have a normal force. Right? Normal forces come from any time you have two surfaces in contact with each other. So surface to surface contact. Those are the key, key things. Anytime you have surfaces contacting, there is a normal force that comes from it. Usually it is a supporting force. Right? Sometimes it's not. Um, for example, here I have this, you know, from this picture, I have this book right, sitting on a table. Uh, essentially, if you look at the atomic level, this book, you know, compresses the atoms below it, 
all right? These atoms, just like a trampoline or something like that, kind of stretch downwards, but they want to go back to where they were. They want to go to a nice flat area, so they push upwards and provide a supporting force um, to the object. Um, one thing to keep in mind, like if I had, you know, like, um, see if I can draw this, but if I had, you know, a hand like this, uh, it's more like a hoof, but if I had a hand on a wall, right, right, I could actually push on the wall like this, and it would actually create a supporting, a, a normal force out like this, okay, so it's not always a supporting force in the fact that something like underneath something, I could push on something else um, like we have here. I can push this way and then I have a supporting force, uh, sorry, a normal force that way. Um, so the key thing is it always acts towards the object and perpendicular, which is another way of saying normal. Normal is a formal, formal way of saying perpendicular. That's why it's called the normal force to the surface. Symbol is N, um, and again, it's also drawn as, you know, F of N, normal force like this, right? A couple different ways that it's drawn. Uh, this is a very, very common one because there is always surface-to-surface -surface contact, or very frequently at least surface-to-surface -surface contact. Okay, a big force in our everyday lives is something called friction. Right. Friction is a force. Uh, it comes from rubbing two surfaces together, and it basically comes from the idea that those surfaces themselves are rough. Right? These are two surfaces, and then one, you know, basically drops down and you know move it sideways or something like that. The idea is that this roughness interacts with that roughness and creates friction. All right. So friction always acts parallel to the surface, and it always acts in the opposite direction of motion uh, or force, which we'll talk about in this example here. So first, if I look at um, this one right here, the, the boy in the sled, all right, I get the idea that um, this sled is moving to the right, all right, okay? The sled is moving to the right, and um, that means that friction is opposing it. Now, with ice, it's probably low friction, a low amount of friction, but it's still being opposed to the right. Okay? So it's still being opposed to the right. So this friction force is going this way, and um, so parallel to the surface and to, I'm sorry, if the motion is going to the right, then the friction is going to the left, like that. Okay, and this is my friction force. I can also have uh, things that are not moving, which friction is present. So the question is, right, if this if this object here, right, is not moving, this person is pulling on it. It's applying a force this way, so it should be moving this way, but. Something called friction is moving, is keeping it still. So a friction force is actually moving perpendicular, right? Um, sorry, not perpendicular, parallel to the surface, as I said, and in the opposite direction of, in this case, the force. So if a force is being applied this way, if this thing is not moving, that means friction is, is acting in the opposite direction and parallel to the surface. All right down here, there's an interaction between two things, a rubbing that's going on, right, that's that's creating the, you know, something where this is not moving, right, and so we draw it up here, and that's a parallel and opposite force called friction. There are two types of friction that we have. Um, we have static friction and kinetic friction. So static friction in particular means, the static part, means stationary or not moving, right? If something, like the previous example, so I'm pulling a box and it's not moving, uh, friction is there, but the object is not moving, so we call that static friction. 
It's friction that keeps an object stationary on a surface and prevents the motion. So we use our symbol for friction, which is this little script DF, and then S for static. If something is moving, like the boy and the sled from the previous slide, and friction is acting, so an object that slides across the surface and friction is acting, then we call that kinetic friction. Again, this is motion, right? Kinetic means, always means motion, right? So we use um, our script DF and then K for kinetic, right? And the idea is that later on there is a fundamental difference between these two and how they act. And we'll have a model, a way to represent that. And so it's good now to go ahead and start labeling these correctly so we can apply them in the future correctly. Last but not least, we have a couple other forces. Um, these will not be things that you'll will use commonly, but just be able to identify them when they do pop up. Uh, nothing that we would need to definitely calculate or anything. Um, the first one is called drag. Uh, it's caused by the force of friction moving through a fluid. Um, you remember, air is a fluid, so actually, uh, in this case, I have, I have a leaf right here. It's falling downwards. The drag of the air acts upwards, and the leaf slowly falls down. If this was a feather or something else like that, that's the way it would, you know, kind of look like. Uh, we use the symbol D for drag, um, and it's always in the opposite direction of motion. So if I, um, if I look at that in a little bit more complex ways, if, if a ball is following some kind of path like this, at this time right here, right, the motion of the ball is in that direction which means that the drag acts in the opposite direction. Later on, the ball may be at here, and its motion is in this direction, but that means now that the drag is in the opposite direction. Right? And you compare this one to this one, right? and the idea is that you know, it always opposes the motion, so drag constantly changes as the motion changes. Next one is thrust. Um, thrust is a force from within an object that propels an object forward. Uh, this is a little bit hard because you say that a uh, force needs an object on and an agent, and it gets complicated as you think in here. Well, there's a bunch of you know you know all this fuel in here. How can that fuel that's inside of an object act on itself? But really what happens is as this thing burns and all this stuff gets ejected, this stuff that's ejected also pushes on the object on its way out. And so now it becomes an external force, right, after it's kind of burned and it pushes the, you know, pushes the, um, the rocket or whatever upwards. And that's called just generically thrust. Right, one of the most important conceptual things that we can do in this class is draw good free body diagrams. Okay, And this is not just a formality step. This is not like drawing a picture or doing whatever. This is absolutely necessary to understanding what's going on. Okay, Free body diagrams or force diagrams are used to represent the forces acting on an object in a simple manner using vectors. So take, essentially I'm going to take you know, something complicated like this and break it down into like something like this. Now this doesn't look necessarily simple right? in a way you can say that this is, but when we think about things, right, and we think about vectors and how we're going to solve things and problems and whatever, this is much easier than something complex like this. So here are the rules. Only one object at the time at a time. We draw a little circle around you know what we're concentrating on. This is the object, the skier with the skis, right? One object. Di diagram only forces acting on the object. Okay? So things that are going on the object, right? Not from the object. Right? Not from the object, but on the object. So a key thing right here is on. 
we pick some kind of coordinate system. Uh, we're free to do however, we, uh, whatever we want for coordinate system. So probably the easiest thing in this case, and we'll have more examples as we go along, is to do something like this, right? Uh, where this is x and this is y, uh, instead of you know a traditional x and y like this, we kind of tilt it to be like that, okay? Uh, up and down the ramp. We draw a dot to represent uh, the object, so this skier right here gets represented as this dot, and we draw and label all forces outward from the dot, right? So no matter how things are acting, like technically there's a normal force that, you know, right here, um, Sorry, normal force right here, uh, there's friction, you know, going on, there's tension going this way. Basically, we summarize everything as one single dot, as we have um, right here, and we show all those forces coming out of the dot. We're simplifying this greatly, all right? And yes, things are more complex in reality, but, but this is how we deal with it, right? So we simplify everything to dot and show the forces coming out of that dot. So let's follow these rules for this example. So here I have a book on a table. Here's my table. And right now I'm going to have a book sitting on top of the table. All right, so we're going to concentrate just on the book. Here's my system right here just concentrating on the book. Uh, let's see, we diagram only the forces acting on the object. So first of all, I want to come over here to the left and I want to list all the forces acting on that object. First thing I will do is that this thing has mass, right, and it exists on Earth. If it has mass and exists on Earth or near some other gravitational source, then it has weight. Okay, so almost in all of these, just like we had, you know, negative 9.8 in the last chapter is something we immediately go to. Here, we're going to go to weight. Um, okay, what other forces? Um, again, there's contact forces and there's, few, you know, field forces or, you know, or long range. All right, so we talked about our only long range one, gravity or weight. So let's talk about some contact. What is it in contact with? Well, it's in contact with the table right here. All right? And the table is specifically acting upwards and supporting it. So there is a surface-to-surface -surface force or a normal force. Okay? There is a normal force. All right? And that is it. Because there's no, nothing else contacting it, and there's no other long-range forces. So, I must draw this now. So, I'm going to draw weight. Always goes down. We talk about it comes, forces acting on the object. Right? And they go outward from the dot. And then normal force. Yes, normal force comes from this surface down here. But it... And when we draw this, it says outward from the dot. So we represent it from the dot. Something like this. Alright, so here's my weight. And then there's my normal force. And I have diagrammed, I have listed, and then diagrammed all the forces acting on the object. Okay, this next one, a book is pushed across a frictionless table. All right, so I have my book here. This is my book. Uh, it's pushed, let's see, just a little fingertip pushing it this way. And um, now I want to diagram all the forces acting. So only one object at a time, so my object is the book. Because I'm talking about, you know, the book is, published, is pushed. Okay. Um, first, what forces are acting? Well, this has weight. It, it has mass and exists on Earth. Um, what other contact forces are there? That's my only field force, so this is, look at contact. Well, first of all, 
it's in contact with the surface. So that means there's a surface to surface normal. And then I also have um, also have this finger that's coming in and making contact with it. Right? So that's a force on the object. Um, so what I'll just call that is a generic force applied. So I'll just say applied. And that's what I use for all of my generic forces. Just some kind of outside applied force. Okay, so now I diagram this. Weight, how does weight act? Weight always acts downward. Uh, normal force, how does that act? Well, it's always towards the object and it's always perpendicular to the surface. All right, so in this case, it would look like that. So I go from here and go up. Normal force. All right, and then I have an applied force. Which direction is this applied force going? To the right. So when I draw it, I have some kind of applied force here. Okay, our next scenario is we have a book is pushed across a rough table. All right, so book is what our object will be, right, and we're going to do forces acting on it, and specifically we're going to have a rough table this time. So one object at a time, this is my object right here, the book. Um, only forces acting on the object. Uh, coordinate system is pretty obvious, just for now, at least x's and y's like that. Uh, draw a dot to represent the object. We got that. Draw and, draw and label all forces outward from the dot. So let's list the forces. First, this thing has mass and exists on Earth. So therefore, there is a weight. Okay. Uh, next, um, I look at, this is my one field force, so I look at my contacts, what are all my contacts going on. Uh, I have a surface right here, a surface contacting the surface, providing a normal force. force. Right? Very common that we've had before. I have my finger that's applying a force here, and I'll just call this an applied force, again for our generic terms. Oh gosh, it's horrible. I was supposed to say applied. Um, and then now that we have a rough table, we have a friction force that arises. Friction force is parallel and opposite the direction of motion. Okay, so now I have a friction. So friction And specifically, this is a, well, it's pushed across the table, so it's moving across the table, so it's a kinetic. Okay. So let's label all of these forces now. I have a weight going down. I have a normal force going up. I have an applied force in my drawing, which is to the right. And then I have a last one, which is a friction force, which opposes my motion. So that goes to the left. And that was a kinetic friction, so I put a little K there. Okay. So this is my free body diagram based off of all of these forces here. Now we're going to get more complicated. So this book sits at rest on a rough and slanted table. So I've drawn that, drawn that underneath here. And so it's rough and it's slanted. So now I have to go through my process again. List of forces. That book has mass, it exists on Earth, therefore it has 
a weight. Okay, this is the one thing that I'm looking at right now. All right, now it's uh, I see two surfaces in contact here. All right, one is kind of doing some support. Uh, all of that indicates I have a normal force. All right, now I got to think about a couple other things. Um, there's no longer anything pushing it. All right, there's no fingers I can draw coming in and pushing it. Um, the only thing else that's going on is a rough surface. A rough surface tells me that there is friction. Okay, so I have friction that is present. What kind of friction? Well, it's at rest. It's not moving. So that means static friction. Now I go through and I draw and label all my forces outward from the dot. Straight down is always my weight. No matter what, that is always my weight. Next, I have normal force. Now, normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. That's part of the definition. Normal means perpendicular. All right, so when I draw this, it's not straight down, it's not straight up, it is at an angle. All right? It's perpendicular to that surface, so it is at an angle. All right? Whatever the surface's angle is, it's at that. So my surface is kind of going like this. All right? That's the plane of my surface, and this is 90 degrees to that. Okay? So... I have the last one. I have friction. Now this is a little bit complicated because I got to think about which way is friction acting. Well, if there was no friction, what would this book do? This book would start sliding down this table. But because friction is there, friction that means friction is acting you know, up this way, All right? So friction is keeping it there, All right? And that's what you got to think about sometimes. You got to think about what would happen if friction was not there, right? And it would slide down. That means that friction must be acting upwards to hold it into place, must be holding it into place. So I have friction, and specifically it's holding it in place at rest. So that is a static friction. Now we're ready to move on to Newton's second law. And really at this point, I'm hoping that this one statement this one set of simple words will stay in your mind the rest of your life. Accelerations come from net forces. Right? Or net forces cause accelerations. However you want to think about it. But this is our you know, reason I have it in a marquee. This is our marquee statement really for this chapter. Accelerations come from net forces. Remember, acceleration can be either something speeding up or just changing direction. Either one of those two. It requires a net force. And that was our new high school definition, college definition of um, Newton's first law, that it has to have an unbalanced force, which means that there has to be some kind of net force to it. So really, second Newton's second law is a mathematical application of the first law. It's the same kind of thing. That if I want to change something's motion, I got to have an unbalanced or the other term we use is net force um, to that. So net forces cause acceleration. This will be up on the board, right? I will point at it at least 10 times a day because it is that uh, important and is one of the key things that you think about in your process as you go solve problems. All right, so here's the idea. I have an object, all right? An object sitting right here. I want to move this object from there to there, so across some kind of distance. This object is at rest. So 
zero speed at this point. And I want to move it to here. So I have to apply, again, if something is at rest, it requires an unbalanced force to move it. Right? So I'm going to have to apply an uh, unbalanced force or, you know, I'm going to apply a force. I can do that in a couple ways. Let's say I apply a very, very small force this way. Well, it's going to slowly move to the right, as I see here. All right, so it's going to slowly move that way. Okay? Now... I have a couple of options now. If I want to get it there faster, another way to say I want to accelerate it more, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to, you know, hit the mess out of it, right? I'm just going to apply a larger force. So if I increase my force, it's no longer this little force here, but now a big force like this, right? So if I apply a big force, or a bigger and bigger force, it's going to get across faster, right? It's going to accelerate more. And we know this, right? We know that if I have an object and I want to get it from point A to B fast, I, you know, hit it really hard. If I hit it soft, it'll get there kind of slow. But if I hit it hard, otherwise saying I apply the force, the larger the force, the larger the acceleration. And they're directly proportional. If I double the force, it will actually double the acceleration. If I triple the force, it will actually triple the acceleration. All right? So if I want to increase acceleration, I increase my force. All right? And this is one of the backbones behind Newton's second law. The next part of Newton's second law says mass, how mass and acceleration are related. Essentially, mass acceler sorry, acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. All right? The other way, the con very conceptual way of saying this is that if I apply an, a, a set force to two different objects, all right, and one is lighter than the other one, the same force, I kick both of them with the same force, the one that is lighter will accelerate more. The one that is heavier when I say heavier has more mass, will accelerate less. If I have a bowling ball and a soccer ball, and I apply the same force to both of them, then guess what? The soccer ball will accelerate more than the bowling ball because of the amount of mass that it has. All right? Again, inertia is tied to mass, so really we're talking about the amount of inertia. So if I double the mass of an object... Um, I will actually have, in, with the same amount of force, I'll have one half the acceleration. Okay, so the way it's represented like this way is that acceleration is proportional to one over the mass, or it's inversely proportional. All right, so you know, this is y, you know, y is you know one over x kind of relationship, All right? And that's what we see. Remember from our math review, we said, okay, it has this kind of sloping time, kind of thing like this, right? And that's, and that's actually true. And as I look at this, if I go from, you know, um, one mass to two masses, I get, you know, one half the force. If I go from one mass to three masses, I get one third the force. One to four masses, I get one fourth, right? And it follows this line like this, right? So if I apply the same amount of force to lighter objects, I get more acceleration. If I apply the same amount of force to heavier objects, I get less acceleration. Again, we know this already, but now we're combining it into an actual law of from Newton. Okay, when I apply those two principles, that acceleration increases with the amount of force and decreases with the uh, increase in mass, or the amount of mass, then it can lead to this one equation, which is essentially Newton's second law, the shorthand version of it, that acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. If I look at this, I can see all the mathematical principles we talked about. If I want to hold um, mass constant, Right, I have two objects the same mass. 
the one that I apply more force to has a greater amount of acceleration. Also, if I have the same force, right? If I increase the mass with the same amount of force, if I increase the mass, then I will actually get less acceleration. Or if I decrease the mass, I will get more acceleration. So everything is tied up into here. All right, those two principles that we talked about in the last two slides. But something is not quite right, right? Because we said that if, I, if something, you know, if I have something sitting on a table like this, right? Sitting on a table, it's acted upon by forces. We talked about all these forces that are going on. Maybe I'm even pushing it and friction's resisting, a bunch of other stuff. Right? Just because there is a force does not mean that there is an acceleration. So we need to specifically say that, right, we have accelerations that come from net forces. And the net is the key thing here. Right? So it's not just an increase in force, but an increase in the net force that an object experiences. So that's better, but we're still missing something else. All right, now we have the idea that you know this acceleration is tied to this net force direction. Really, we're talking about we're talking about vectors, so it's not that it accelerates that amount of value, but it accelerates in the same direction as the net force vector. All right, so if there's a net force on an object, you know, here's an object and there's, you know, a bunch of forces going on. Maybe this one's much bigger than whatever. All right, I get the idea that there's a net force to the right, so this will accelerate to the right in the direction of that net force. And we'll see that as we kind of develop this thought a little bit more later on. But the key thing is that Newton's second law says accelerations increase with the amount of force that are applied if the mass stays the same, right? And if the mass um, is increased, or we have two different objects that have different masses, and they receive the same net force, then the one with the more mass will accelerate less, the one with the less mass will accelerate more. All tied into this simple, simple equation. Now, this equation is often written in this format. This is a perfectly acceptable format. It's just rearranged from the previous thing, but um, it is not preferred because the acceleration equals net force over, um, over mass gives me a better conceptual understanding. I understand that my, uh, my acceleration changes based off of my force and my mass. The net force here, if I look at this, it's not as clear. But, you know, this is our shorthand, and then we usually, usually say F equals MA as a shorthand. But, you know, really, you try to keep this in your head as a better conceptual understanding of the relationship. And this is really how Newton's second law is kind of written, to, uh, to have this better conceptual understanding. But we just reverted over years to... You know this this one right here. All right. So since we're dealing with forces mathematically, we have to have some kind of unit to assign it. If I actually look, uh, what's a mass? A mass is a kilogram. Uh, what is an acceleration? Acceleration is in meters per second. So if I multiply these together, essentially kilograms times mass divided by second squared. You know, I get this right here. A kilogram, kilogram meter per second squared as one unit. Now that's too much to say. So what we do is we replace that by the capital N or Newton. Right? We say that this is, you know, basically one of these kilogram meter per second squared is one, you know, Newton. And we just say capital N, you know, Newton which is a kilogram meter per second squared. So now we get to our small but important numerical process in this chapter. For the most part, this chapter is all about concept except for a few of these examples. Um, a Boeing 737 has a mass of 51,000 kilograms. It sits at rest at the end of a runway. 
The pilot turns on a pair of jet engines to full throttle, and the airplane accelerates down the runway. After traveling 940 meters, the plane reaches 70 meters per second. What is the thrust of each engine? All right. In the previous chapter, we had been given mass, and mass typically did not matter. All right. We had our kinematic equation game. There was no mass involved. But now we're talking about forces, and we're talking about thrust of the engine and force of the engine, not just the acceleration, but the actual forces involved. All right, so now mass will matter. All right, so let's, let's draw our example here. So I'm going to draw this awesome plane. Here's my plane. All right, it's going to start here, and I'll say that it has an initial velocity is equal to zero. It reaches the end of the runway, right, and it reaches a final velocity of 70 meters per second. All right, so it reaches 70 meters per second. And it travels 940 meters. All right, so it had original state of motion, which was at rest, and then it reached some other state of motion, 70 meters per second. So it had to accelerate. In order to accelerate, it had to have a net force acting on it. So the question is, what is that thrust of each of the two uh, engines? Right, so it's a pair, so we have to deal with that. First of all, I have to apply Newton's second law, which is my acceleration comes from my net force. All right, and divided by my mass. What I'm trying to find is my, essentially my net force here. All right, so that's what I'm trying to find. So I can use F equals MA in a kind of a shorthand. I'll go ahead and plug in what I have here. Um, so I need to, new, to know a couple things. One is I have my mass. I actually have that, 51,000. I can go ahead and plug that in. And I'll write that down, 51 comma zero 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 kilograms okay and that's going to be equal to my net force okay and oh that's equal that is equal to my acceleration but I don't know what my acceleration is so I actually had to go and use this information and play the kinematic equation game so I have my delta x I have my final velocity I have my initial velocity, and now I need an acceleration. So let me zoom in over here to get more space. And let's write this out. 2a delta x is equal to final velocity squared minus initial velocity squared. Um, I'm trying to solve for acceleration, so I'll leave that like that. Uh, 940 meters is my displacement. My final velocity is 70 meters per second, or about 150 miles an hour. That gets squared, and that's going to be minus my initial velocity squared, which is zero. All right, so this is uh, 1880 times A, and this is 4900. That's technically meters squared per second squared. Um, okay, and so let's see what this value is. Okay, I plug it into the calculator and I get 2.722222222222 whatever technically this keeps on repeating um, uh, meters per second squared. So that's what I'm going to plug into my equation over here. All right, so I get acceleration is equal to 2. Uh, seven two two right uh, meters per second squared. All right, now I take that value here, multiply by fifty one thousand, and I get a net force 
that is equal to 138,833 newtons, right? And that's my net force on the aircraft. Um, technically, the question asks from each engine, so I'm going to take that and just divide by 2. And each engine provides 69,000... Uh, 417 newtons of thrust. So that's my force of thrust from each engine. Okay, uh, six, 69,417 newtons. So again, what I did was I uh, took a kinematics problem and took it a step further. This is a initial velocity, final velocity, and a displacement that creates and uh, I can find acceleration from that and knowing a mass right I can actually find out what force is required uh, to produce that acceleration and then I applied the kin then I applied the idea that there's two engines and so I divide that in two okay a similar problem here also I have a 1500 kilogram car which is about a standard sedan weight uh, it's traveling along a straight road at 20 meters per second I have my road here's my car here's my car again um, it initially is going uh, 20 meters per second and at the end it's going 21 meters per second um, I don't know my distance, but I know that the time or my delta t change in time is basically two seconds. It takes two seconds for it to to kind of accelerate to that. All right. So, uh, what is the magnitude of the net force acting on the car during this time? Magnitude just means I don't care about direction. So, if I want to know a net force, I'm using Newton's second law or mathematical application, and that's equal to mass times acceleration. Okay, so what do I know? I know it's a 1,500 kilogram car. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to find this left side, so I'm trying to find net force. So I'll leave that there. Uh, but what I need to do first is find acceleration. So let's see, uh, VF equals VI plus AT. All right, plug in these values, 21, 20, plus A times T. So that's 1, so my acceleration is 0 0.5 meters per second squared. So this is 0 0.5 meters per second squared. Multiply those two together and I get 750 newtons of force is required to accelerate 1500 kilograms worth of mass at a half a meter per second squared given the fact that I have this kinematic um, relationship here going from 20 to 21 meters per second in a period of two seconds. Now I can ask a very similar question by using a graph. All right, and what I have here is an acceleration. It's not a typical graph. It's an acceleration versus force graph. All right. So I have to read this as in, uh, what is my acceleration? This is my independent variable here. How does my acceleration change as my force changes? So I see it's a, as my force increases, my acceleration increases, All right? Uh, if I actually looked at this, uh, anytime I see something like that, I say usually say that, hmm, I wonder if slope is important. What does slope tell me in this case? So slope is rise, you know, rise over run, all right? So that means it's acceleration divided by... Oh, not mass, but acceleration divided by net force. All right? 
if, if I look at this force, you know, Newton's second law says force equals mass times acceleration. So if I were to rearrange this by moving this under here, all right, I get that uh, acceleration and mass are kind of tied together with the, sorry, acceleration and force are tied together by the relationship of mass. So if I want to know what the mass is in this figure, uh, I could look at the slope. And if I look at the slope, um, then the slope basically becomes 1 over mass. Um, let's do a little bit more numerical way the first time. So let's not look, necessarily look at the slope, but let's look at these values. If I apply 1 newton of force, I get 4 meters per second squared of acceleration. If I apply 0.5 newtons of force, I get 2. All right, so really, if I look at this and, you know, if I apply 0.25, I get 1. All right, so there's a 4 times, right, 4 times things. So, you know, 1 times 4 equals 4. 0.5 times 4 equals 2. 0.25 times 4 equals this, right? So there's some kind of constant relationship, and that's my really my relationship with my mass. Um, so I can actually use this. Um, and I have, let's say, I'll just look at this. At one, at one newton, I'm getting four meters per second squared. This is a constant relationship, so I can just kind of use any kind of two combination of numbers. So, you know, F equals MA if I take that generic one. And again, this is really net force, and this is really, you know, vectors. Um, so if I take that, then my force is one newton is equal to some unknown mass times 4 meters per second squared. Okay, do my rearranging there and I get my mass is 0 0.25 kilograms. Right. If I were to redo this with 0 0.5 in this spot and 2 in this spot, I would get the same answer. If I were to do this with 0.25 I'm sorry, yeah, 0 0.25 and also, you know, 1, I would get the same answer. Um, so the idea is that uh, there's a constant relationship between these two. And that can be seen in a plot like this. And we can kind of pull out the information. And so the idea is that there is a constant relationship between acceleration and force. Newton's first and second laws tend to be more easily adopted than Newton's third law. And Newton's third law really believe, you know, really forces belief in Newton's laws themselves. So I'll go ahead and tell you. Newton's third law says every action has an equal and opposite reaction. All right, that's my generic definition. That's probably one that you learned in 7th and 8th grade. And it is absolutely true. There's no middle school version or high school version, but there really needs to be a belief in this. First of all, let's break this down and let's talk about action and reaction. Now, first of all, I have to say that this is a simultaneous event. Except, essentially, when two things act, or when a force acts, there's an equal and opposite reaction. There's no delay. It is instantaneous. And it actually, it's so instantaneous that you can't even necessarily perceive which thing initiated the force, or which, which object initiated the action, because it's simultaneously um, uh, done. All forces act in pairs and in opposite directions. Okay, so there's always an equal and opposite. And again, that's the opposite part of that. There's always a pair between things. If you, you, you can't break physics by saying that there is no pair. There's only one force acting. In, in reality, there's always pairs of forces acting, but on different objects. One acts on the other object, like object A acts on object B, but object B must also act back on object A by Newton's third law. The prime example that I use a lot is I can't go around punching walls. I can go beating up on walls, but guess what? In order to punch that wall, to beat up on that wall, my hand is going to get hit back. My hand is going to get beat up back. All right. 
So this becomes difficult because there's no way that I can hit the wall harder than the wall hits my hand back. All right, and this is regardless of size, and this is this is where people mess up. Regardless of the size, all right, they they experience the same magnitude of force. This is also regardless of the speed. It's not listed on here, but speed also applies regardless of the speed. All right, if I increase my speed, I hit the I basically I hit the wall harder. It does not change the fact that my hand will experience just as much force as that wall, right? We call these action-reaction pairs, and these can be difficult sometimes to identify. The key thing I would say is that key into the, um, to the way it's written. If A is on B, then guess what? Then B is on A. If I punch the wall with 10 newtons of force, then the wall punches my hand with 10 newtons of force. All right, if it's usually written in that combination of this on this, then what is that on this? Then you know, then you can kind of see how one thing trades off with another. All right, so here's the situation. I drive down the highway, the road, and I'm a big old Mack truck. And I hit a butterfly floating in the air with my windshield. Right, so poor butterfly smacked in my windshield going down 98. Question is, which experiences the greatest amount of force, the butterfly or the windshield? And this is where our logic and our thinking breaks down. We think about the end result, and we think about that poor butterfly smushed, smushed into the windshield. All right. And we don't think about our windshield in that same way. But if we think logically and we think in Newton's third law and in this frame of mind, then we know that every force has an equal and opposite reaction. right? And so every force has an equal and opposite force, which means that nothing can, nothing can push on something else more than it can receive that same force back. So when you hit that butterfly with your windshield... The butterfly exerts the exact same amount of force as you apply to it. It applies that exact same amount of force back to your windshield. So the question doesn't become which one is greater or less, because we know they have to be equal by Newton's third law. The question becomes, who is more equipped to handle that force? Is a big old car more equipped to handle that force, or is a tiny little exoskeleton butterfly more equipped and of course the big Mack truck is more equipped to handle that force it is built of steel metal whatever it can handle it the butterfly cannot and that's why you see the result of that each one experiences equal and opposite forces there's no way that I can headbutt somebody and they cannot experience more force than I experience back on my head. So headbutting is stupid, right? Because I exert the exact same amount of force in their head as their head exerts back on me. Equal and opposite. Regardless of size, regardless of speed. If I expand this even further, I, instead of hitting a butterfly, I hit a Volkswagen Beetle, right? which experiences the greatest amount of force. Again, Newton's third law, I have to go back to that, equal and opposite forces. I cannot have contact with something and exert a greater amount of force than I receive from that same object. All right, so it doesn't matter. A head-on collision between a Mack truck and a Beetle, each object experiences the exact same amount of force. And this is where you have to really believe in Newton's third law. Right, you can't just spit it out, right? Because I think we've all learned this phrase before. But Newton's third law has to be believed and to and to be really applied. Uh, which experiences the greatest amount of force is basically saying that they experience the same. Which is more equipped to handle that force? The tiny little Volkswagen Beetle or the big Mack truck? And you gotta say the big Mack truck. So what's gonna happen? The beetle is gonna be smushed. The Mack truck's probably going to keep on going. 
some things to keep in mind, and typically it's not something I talk about necessarily in my regular physics class because it's a little complicated to think about. Um, but there are action-reaction pairs and hidden in everyday life. We depend on them um, to basically move forward. Um, you know, basically we want to move forward. We say, okay, well, we just kind of move forward. We walk. But the idea is that if there, is, was, if there was no friction, there was no friction, there would be no motion, right? There would be no motion forward. And any motion that was created would continue to be, you know, going in a straight line. Um, so in this case, if this surface right here was, there was no friction here, and this person tried to walk, right, stepped down and was walk, trying to walk like this, then that person was, if there was no friction, that person would never go anywhere because there's never anything to push against. What happens is that I have an action-reaction pair. The person, the, f the friction of a person pushing on the surface is met by the friction of the surface pushing on the person. So you see how these are opposite. Surface on person, person on surface. Right? That indicates a good action-reaction pair. And this force is what we use to propel us forward by exerting this force on the surface. We do the exact same thing when we drive. Our car tire right here exerts a force on the road this way which then the road exerts a force back on the tire, right? Again, simultaneously, that happens, and that's what propels us forward. Uh, if you think about it this way, like, you know, if you have a, you know, you're peeling out and this is all gravel or something like that, what happens? All these rocks go spewing out this way, or mud or something else like that. They're being spewed out that way because the tires are exerting a force on them to go out like that, right? And because of that the object or the ground or whatever is putting a force back on the tire which is propelling the object or the car forward. So without any friction we couldn't walk and without any friction we could not drive. Friction also hurts us in other times but in a lot of times it can help us actually move. Without it we could not move.